Welcome, Konnichiwa and Hai Sai to all of you. I'm very happy that we have uh, today Johannes Krause as a guest speaker to address an issue that has been indeed an overarching topic throughout the series of uh, the presidential lectures that we started in 2017. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? These are crucial questions for scientists, philosophers, for politicians. I thought I have a carrying voice, but it's OK. <laughs> for politicians, the like. And these were really questions that we tried to address from various angles in that series of lectures. Now, some of you may remember the very first lecture we had was an astrophysicist who was discussing with us the Big Bang rightfully had to be the first lecture. We have subsequently had discussions about how an organism develops. develops. Nislein Wolhard was here, the Nobel Prize laureate, to talk about an individual organism and the genetic switches. We had a group, actually a couple, that gave a talk on the tree of life. So we were discussing where and how does do the various organisms during evolution arise? And today, we have the great fortune to have with Johannes Krause somebody who will tell us about the tree of human beings. Where do we come from as human beings? What are we currently if compared to our past? And where might we going? I think the last one is not exactly his topic. That's more a topic for philosophers, maybe genetic engineers and the likes. We can have that at some other point. So Johannes Krause is one of the fathers of what's called archaeogenetics. So it combines, really, archaeology with genetics. And I might say it gives archaeology a complete additional and super level of precision. And some of the uh, findings that archaeologists have come up with already were corrected, as we heard yesterday from Johannes in his talk when he addressed the migrations of human beings primarily looking at Europe. So today, we have something that should be of interest to all of us. The genetic history of the Ryukyuan Islands, and I'm sure he will take a larger um, attempt uh, to address that particular question. So Johannes uh, has been the founding professor of a really brand new Max Planck Institute that was constituted 2014, the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. <laughs> and Johannes has been trained very well uh, because he has been a student and postdoc with Svante Pebo, who is also coming here in about a month's time. Mark it in your calendar. And together with Svante, he has really revolutionized our understanding from where hominids come from. We owe him the finding that our forefathers had sex with Neanderthalers. That's not to be taken lightly. We owe him the finding that there are new hominids in Asia, like the Denisova man. And we will owe him more if he continues to do and work along this line in the years to come. So for today, I think I, we all would like to welcome Johannes, giving us an insight into the genetic history of the Ryukians. Johannes, we are happy to have you. So first of all, thank you all for coming. It's so great to have you all here. And thanks, Peter, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And slightly intimidated, I have to say, because I will be talking about a topic that is very new to me as well. We have very many research projects in our institute, 
And the genetic history of the Ryukyuan Islands is just one of many, uh, many projects that we're working on. And I have to say, standing in front of you, basically all of you living on the Ryukyuan Islands, you're really the experts here. And I'm really the person that knows very little about it. So um, bear with me if there are some things that I don't pronounce right. And also bear with me if there are things that I might not be so familiar with that might be even wrong what I'm saying. But I want to uh, present, especially in the second part of my uh, presentation, some of the interesting results that we could um, get from studying the DNA of the people that lived here on the Ryukyuan Islands thousands of years ago and what they tell us about the genetic history, about the migration background, and basically where the people that live here today were coming from and what was their um, genetic history. But before I do that, I want to give you a bit of a um, introduction to the topic of archaeogenetics, as well as some of the research and some of the projects that we have been working on that gives you a bit of an introduction to um, genetic history in itself. So as Peter already mentioned, I'm from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, which was actually the last institute that Peter helped to establish, which is in Jena in eastern Germany. It was actually an institute before for economics that was redirected with this new topic that we now call, call the science of human history. The institute currently has three directors, which is quite common in the Max Planck Society, so that an institute doesn't just have one director, but there are actually multiple directors. So one is Russell Gray, who heads the Department of Linguistics and Cultural Evolution, then myself heading the Department of um, Archaeogenetics, and then Nicole Bouvant, who joined us in 2016, and she's heading the Department of Archaeology. And what we all have in common in this institute is that we use scientific approaches to ask big questions from basically the human past or human history. So mass, much of our approaches are laboratory based, like in genetics, proteomics, or isotope research, for example. We also do a lot of field research. So we have people that go in the field, for example, doing archaeological excavations. There's experimental approaches that people do in the cultural evolution department, comparing different cultures with each other. And of course, there's a lot of computational approaches. So we have a lot of computational scientists that, for example, generate large databases to compare different languages with each other, different cultural uh, traits with each other, but of course also uh, genetic data, proteomic data, or isotopic data. So what we basically then generate with this scientific approach is that we apply to this kind of big picture questions from the past, this big data. And we're some sort of bridging the gap between the humanities and the natural sciences. Many of you might be familiar that sometime in the 19th century, really the humanities and the natural sciences went different ways. But what we are trying here is really to bring them back together, to have basically a scientific approach from the natural sciences to big questions from human history and archaeology, so more from the um, humanities side. So we currently have projects really all over the world, so this is a quite a kind of large-scale institute. We have about 220 people working in, in the institute right now with projects uh, basically on all continents, um, mainly in, in, in Asia, uh, some also in Africa, but also quite a few uh, projects in Oceania. Um, and for example, the Department of Archaeology also does a lot of field research, so they do excavations, so they have a strong focus on East Africa, Arabia, as well as Central Asia, but also some work in Southern Asia here, um, as well as on the Philippines. Whereas the Department of Linguistics and Cultural Evolution does really worldwide work. They uh, bring together large databases of all languages that are known, which is more than 7,000, where they, for example, look at cognates, so basically words that are kind of related to each other, like German Tür and Door, for example, uh, or Bridge and, and Brücke. And then they uh, accumulate those large databases and then reconstruct the phylogenies of languages. So they really build language trees. And not only do they look at how languages are related to each other, like the Ryukyuan la languages, for example, and the uh, Japanese language, which are closely related, they're the Japonic language family, but they're also um, trying to understand when the different languages diverged from each other. So they're doing dating of the different splits of the different languages. And that they can, for example, do by using dead languages, like Latin. So if you take Latin, you compare that to Italian, to Spanish, to French, which are all Roman languages, Romantic languages, and then you have Latin, you can actually see how this kind of fossil language compares to the modern languages and how many things changed over the last 2,000 years. So then you have a reference point, basically a calibration point, that then tells you maybe something about when other languages diverged from each other in the past. So if you have many different uh, calibration points, like 
uh, he is Dukarian, for example, or Anatolian, which is a language that was spoken three and a half thousand years ago in Turkey, you can then, for example, reconstruct the common ancestor of all Indo-European languages, which is the biggest language group or biggest language family we have in the world today. But they're also doing a lot of work in this region here, which you can see has a lot of languages. Um, it's Papua New Guinea, as well as here, Vanuatu, which is an island um, archipelago, which has also high diversity of languages, um, sometimes called the Galapagos of languages, because there's more than 150 languages spoken on each of those little islands. And this island was only settled 3,000 years ago. So 3,000 years, there were hundreds of languages born, which is also a very interesting process. So my department is doing archaeogenetics. So what is archaeogenetics? What we basically do is we take bones from the past, so ancient skeletons. We drill little holes into those bones. And from those holes, we extract bone powder, which we can release the DNA from that might be still stuck in those ancient bones. And DNA, of course, is a wonderful molecule because it's extremely stable, because it has, of course, your, your kind of building plan, your blueprint, which should be conserved. So nature has created this molecule to be extremely stable. And therefore, this, this molecule sometimes survives over thousands of years. So the oldest DNA that has been so far analyzed is almost a million years old, which is an almost complete genome of a horse from Alaska, so from the permafrost. It was frozen for a very long time, but still is very um, uh, amazing to find this ancient DNA to be preserved for such a long time. And that DNA, after it gets released, it gets put into modern molecular labs, where it gets prepared for DNA sequencing. And then that DNA usually gets sequenced on those sequencing machines. And many of you are maybe aware of this big revolution that happened over the last 15 years with this technology, which you now call high throughput sequencing, or sometimes also called next generation sequencing, which has really improved a lot. So those machines now allow billions of DNA sequences to be reconstructed or sequenced each day on such a machine. If you compare that 15 years ago, such a machine only produced 100 DNA sequences at a time. So it's 100 million fold higher throughput. So the first genome that was ever sequenced cost about $2 billion. Now we can get one for $100, right? So that was really a big change. And that also allows us now to study a lot of those ancient skeletons from the past. But we're not just interested in the DNA of the people that we might be able to reconstruct from ancient teeth or, or skulls or, or other parts of the human skeleton. We are also sometimes interested in, for example, the microbes that were living in the people or on the people in the past. And one way to study the microbes that were living on people, so the bacteria, for example, that were living in the mouse of people from the past is, uh, is studying dental calculus, which is a biofilm that forms on your teeth. So the moment that you're sitting in front of me and you just had lunch, I guess many of you, and many of you might have not brushed your teeth. Who has brushed their teeth? <laughs> one, one person, OK, good. So you're the only one that will not build up this biofilm, <laughs> but the rest will. And this biofilm, if you don't brush your teeth tonight, which of course most of you will hopefully do, so if you don't do that for many weeks, your teeth will look like that. Now everybody will brush their teeth, <laughs> right? And, and this is quite gross, but this is basically the biofilm that, that builds through time. And it's, it's, it's like fossilizing in your mouth. And the amazing thing is that you can actually extract DNA even from thousands of year old Neanderthal calculus, and you can still get DNA from that. Actually very high amounts, very good uh, quality. Sometimes you also have other remains, very special remains, when people have left us certain round traces in a cave, for example, in a dark corner. And they're really well preserved. Uh, those things are called coprolites. And they even preserve then the microbiome of the, of, the, of the intestine. So we can really then study also the microbiomes of the bacteria that were living in the, in the gut of people from the past. So we have several thousand year old microbiomes now also from, from people from the past, which of course is interesting. It's an important field of research right now also in medical research. And this is mostly research that's done by one of my group leaders, Tina Warner, who is uh, doing this studies of ancient microbiomes. She studies that from dental calculus, so from this, from this biofilm here, um, but also from the, from the um, uh, coprolites. And she then basically reconstructs the, the bacterial communities that used to be living in those people in the past and then looks at how they changed uh, through time. So what were kind of typical oral bacteria thousands of years ago in humans or in Neanderthals, or then, of course, in our closest relatives from, from modern DNA. 
what she also does is she reconstructs also the, the proteins from the diet of the people. So you can also learn something which is basically also stuck in the dental calculus about what type of food people were eating, what type of milk they were drinking. Was it cow milk? Was it goat milk? Was it sheep milk? And that you can do with proteomics. But we're not just interested basically in the kind of good bacteria, the oral microbiome, for example, and the microbiome of the gut. We are also interested in the bad guys, the pathogens. So we have a strong focus in my department of people studying pathogens from the past. So what we basically do is we take a skeleton from the past and we then extract DNA from mainly the teeth because inside a tooth you have dried blood. And in the dried blood you might have the pathogen that was responsible for basically the death of the person. So if a person died of plague during the Black Death in the 14th century, in the dried blood you still have the bacteria, bacterial DNA, of Yersinia pestis, and that's something we can reconstruct, and I've done a lot of that type of work, and we did basically the pioneering work for this field of research, which we call ancient pathogenomics. Over the last few years, there was two of my group leaders in the department in, in our institute, and Verena, she was a group leader of mine. She's now a professor in Zurich in Switzerland. So we did a lot of work on, on Yersinia pestis, um, where we reconstructed it through the last 5,000 years now. The oldest plague we now have um, analyzed is actually from the Stone Age, we also looked at Mycobacterium leprae, which is the causative agent of leprosy. We have been looking at Treponema pallidum that causes syphilis, so from the past, from the new world, as well as from the old world. Um, we also did a lot of work on Mycobacterium tuberculosis, for example, reconstructing it from the Americas before Columbus, which was actually interesting because what we found was not a typical form of tuberculosis you find in people today, but what actually the people had, the Native Americans before Columbus, was a form of tuberculosis today we find in seals and sea lions. So something basically jumped as a zoonotic transmission from seals into the human population. Um, we have also a strong focus on the diseases that were introduced by the Spanish and other colonizers into the Americas. We, for example, could identify that Salmonella enterica causing typhoid fever was one of them. And we recently reconstructed the genome of Heliobacter pylori together with colleagues from Bolzano who are curators of this guy. This is the Iceman. This was a, a person that was frozen, that was stuck in the ice for five and a half thousand years and had a basically well-preserved stomach. And from the stomach, from the frozen stomach, we could actually reconstruct Heliobacter pylori, which are the bacteria that live in the stomach of people. And we could then see how they changed over the last uh, 5,000 years. Those are mostly bacterial genomes, of course, the bacterial pathogens. We recently also started to study ancient viruses. Um, so together with uh, some colleagues here, um, where we now were able to even reconstruct viruses from the Neolithic time from Europe that are about 7,000 years old, and they're the oldest virus genomes that have been analyzed so far. Um, which was interesting was that the Neolithic HBV, so hepatitis B virus that we could reconstruct here, is actually clustering with modern day apes, so with chimpanzee and gorilla, and does not fall together with modern HPV diversity, which was a bit of a surprise. What I should also say, and I already mentioned that yesterday, that this type of research always attracts a lot of attention. And mostly that is because of a famous Spielberg movie that was broadcast in the early 1990s, that many of you might have seen, Jurassic Park, which basically triggered the imagination that in old bones, you can have DNA, and you could even then use that to recreate dinosaurs or something like that. Of course, today we know this is not possible. We cannot get DNA from dinosaurs, unfortunately, because I also like that movie. And that's maybe the reason why I do what I do now. Um, but still, the public is very interested in this research field, because it's just an amazing thing that you can study uh, things from the past. So we always get a lot of news reports, like you can see here with this um, HPV um, genome that, that we published. Sometimes also the tabloid press becomes interested in that. And there's a German famous newspaper. It's called the Bild Zeitung. Uh, they had this kind of nice cover here with this uh, story of the Neolithic virus and called it the first sex offender, which is kind of funny, um, as long as you don't have a picture of yourself in the corner here, uh, which um, <laughs> is maybe not so funny anymore. Um, but today, I don't want to talk about the pathogens. I really want to talk about the genetic history of people, especially of the Ryukyuan uh, islands, of course. But before that, I want to talk a bit about our own um, genetic history, the genetic history of modern humans. And Peter already alluded to that. At the beginning, I did do a lot of work during my PhD and postdoc on 
the um, basically ancestry of modern humans, where did they come from, and of course also archaic humans like Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and I even worked on those guys here, Homo floresiensis, even though I was never able to get DNA out of them, but I still had the chance to study them and actually drill little holes into the type specimen. Um, and uh, that is, of course, a story which is much older than the settlement history of a lot of other places, because that's a story of us, so anatomical modern humans, leaving Africa and moving into different parts of the world. And based on genetic data, as well as on archaeological data and paleoanthropological data, we currently um, uh, assume that modern humans, sometime between 200 and 300,000 years, emerged somewhere in Africa. We don't know where, probably all over Africa and then left Africa about 50,000 years ago. And you often hear news about older fossils that are found outside Africa, like in China, there was a new fossil of anatomical modern humans just published in science that was 100,000 years old, one that is 120,000 years old, one that is 70,000 years old. So there are fossils of humans outside Africa that are supposed to be modern humans, who are supposed to be Homo sapiens, but if that is true, they have not contributed genetically to the people that live in the world today. So based on the genetic data, it's very clear that we emerged out of Africa 50,000 years ago. We cannot push this further back because we have fossils now and DNA from those fossils from just basically the common ancestor of all people outside Africa. So, and this is 50,000 years. We can't move that further back in time. So this is actually a well understood process. Um, what is not so well of an understood process is what happened to the other people that were living outside Africa when we came into Europe and Asia. Well, that are those archaic humans like Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and Floresiensis. Fortunately, those people also have DNA preserved. So this was some work that was doing during my PhD where I looked at many different Neanderthal fossils and tested whether there is still DNA in them from the Neanderthals. I was from different sides of Europe, and I was also lucky to get some DNA of Neanderthals that at that time we actually didn't know were living in the Altai Mountains in southern Siberia. And one of the questions we had in this project that then emerged out of this work, which was the Neanderthal Genome Project, was this question, when those two met, so when modern humans came out of Africa and met Neanderthals, did they fall in love with each other? Did they have children with each other? So are those actually our ancestors? Have they contributed to us? Or are those basically completely different lineages and was there never any genetic admixture? So after a lot of work with a lot of people um, that kind of gathered up in this large team um, under the kind of guidance of Svante Pebo, of course, we then were able, by extracting a lot of DNA, mainly from those three little pieces of bone here, um, to reconstruct the first genome of a Neanderthal which was a very bad quality genome. It was only about 50% of the genome, and there was large gaps, so it was low quality. Meanwhile, Svante has done much more work and has produced some wonderful high quality genomes. And that basically then allowed us to directly compare those two and see what are the genetic differences. And Peter just said that Svante will come in a month, so I won't spoil all the results that he has produced or that came out of this work, of this direct comparison between Neanderthals and modern humans. But the main result I still want to share with you, which was already mentioned, and that was whether there was genetic admixture. So what we could find was that all people in sub-Saharan Africa don't harbor any Neanderthal DNA. So they don't have any genetic admixture. So there's no Neanderthal DNA found in sub-Saharan Africans. However, this is different for Europeans. So Europeans have about 2% Neanderthal admixture, which is not a lot, but it's still enough. Some genes are in high frequency, even 60 70% of Europeans carry those Neanderthal genes now, and Swante and Mans might tell you more about what type of phenotypes they're actually coding for. What was a big surprise then, however, was that even though Neanderthals were mostly living in Europe, you find Neanderthal DNA actually even in a higher percent in East Asians I mean, maybe not in general Mao, but maybe yeah, 2.1 percent or so. But in average, East Asians have 2.2 percent. That would also be true for people in Japan. So you actually have more Neanderthal DNA in your genome than people in Europe have, which is quite interesting. And we find about the same 2.2 percent in people in Papua New Guinea. So again, it's not much, but it's 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 quite some contribution. And I was also extremely lucky um, that. I could work on a specimen which is actually very tiny. This was this little piece of bone that I got sent by a collaboration partner from Novosibirsk. Uh, 
And I studied it, so I wanted to see what type of DNA it is. He sent it to me telling me it's a modern human, because I was working on early modern humans at the time. However, when I got the DNA of this bone, I saw it's not a human, and it's not a Neanderthal, but it's something new. And that was very exciting. It was a new form of human. So if we compare that, so it was found in this cave here, which is um, in basically central Eurasia. So it's in the Altai Mountains. It's called the Lisova Cave. And we can compare this little piece of, of human bone. So at the time, we had a finger bone. Now there's also some teeth from it. When you compare it to modern humans, um, you can actually see it's, it's closer related to a Neanderthal than it is to a modern human. But still, between Neanderthals and this, what we then call that's German here, but kind of the English word would be Denisovan. Um, it's, it's about 400,000 years um, kind of derived from, from the Neanderthal. So it's like if you want the, the Asian Neanderthal, it's some sort of sister branch to Neanderthals, but it's quite, quite diverged from the, from the um, Neanderthal. We could then also see in which populations in the world do you find that DNA of this Denisovan, and of course there are many more studies um, that uh, followed up this work, which probably Svante will be talking about. But we could actually not find any detectable amount of Denisovan DNA again in Africa, but also not in Europe and even not in Asia, even though they were living here in Central Asia, which was a bit of a surprise. But what was even more a surprise is that people in Papua New Guinea had about 5% Denisovan DNA. So they actually have Neanderthal DNA plus the Denisovan DNA. So there was now probably, if you look at this picture, you could reconstructed there were two admixture events, at least, between those different archaic humans and modern humans. So Neanderthals admixed with a common ancestor of all people outside Africa. So basically, the humans left Africa, they met Neanderthals, and then they took this 2% Neanderthal ancestry to all those places um, outside Africa. And for the Denisovans, there seems to be evidence for only one major genetic admixture event that probably happened somewhere in Southeast Asia. I should say there's also a minor contribution of Denisovan DNA in East Asians. And there was a study that was only published last year that even claimed that people in Japan have a different type of Denisovan ancestry than people in Papua New Guinea. So there is now also evidence for at least two admixture events between those Denisovans and people in Asia. When Svante comes, he will show you an even more complex slide because they have now found all kinds of different types of genetic admixture, which basically tells us that humans were mixing with each other, basically having sex with each other for the last million years, which is maybe not a surprise because they still do that today, but uh, still, <laughs> it's, it's good to know. But what happened after this Neanderthal project, and I should say, this work here, that took us six, seven years, that cost a lot of money, it was a whole department working on that, it was really a group effort, to sequence two bad quality ancient genomes, right? What happened after this project was, however, what we now call kind of a revolution in ancient DNA because our techniques became better, like it often is. Of course, technology drives the research. And we were able to sequence more and more ancient genomes. And by now, we have sequenced about 7,000 ancient human genomes. So it's quite amazing. If you actually look at the map, you can actually see each purple dot here is an ancient human genome that we have reconstructed. Those are not Neanderthals, those are not Denisovans, but actually our own ancestors. So archaic or early um, modern humans, so ancient modern humans. In blue, uh, or kind of this magenta, no, but, but that's not magenta, that's magenta. I guess this is a mint green or something like that, maybe Max Planck green, we could call it. Um, you can actually see this is our modern populations where we have modern data. So this is basically our data set that we're currently mostly working with if we study the genetic history of modern humans. So you can see we have modern data from all over the world, but from ancient DNA, we really have a strong focus here in Europe. So this is where most of our data currently comes from. And that is just because most of the research institutes are here, and there's a lot of skeletons that are available uh, to be studied. So we've done a lot of work on those ancient uh, genomes. Um, there were many articles published. I just want to mention a few that I had been uh, quite involved in, where we then reconstructed mostly what Peter already mentioned, the genetic history of Europeans. So you see Euro Europeans, 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 OK, Eurasians here, but it's mostly still Europeans. And one of the major results was that we could show that modern day Europeans are a, a kind of mixture, a genetic mixture between three ancestral populations. So besides the bit of Neanderthal DNA they have, they basically come from three different parts of Eurasia. So there's a genetic contribution from Anatolia. There's one of basically the or original Europeans, the indigenous Europeans, if you want. And then there's a genetic component that came from Central Asia about 5,000 years ago or so. 
And this is something that we can then also study in terms of ancestral components. So basically modern Europeans having those three ancestral components. You can go back in time. So this is basically a time slice, so like an archaeological dig where you kind of go deeper and deeper and deeper and you look at the ancient skeletons and see what their genetic makeup is. You see the kind of 7,000 year old ones here have a makeup of early farmers, and then through time that changes. And then here sometimes there are those major changes, like here's this occurrence of this green component that wasn't there before, that comes from the steppes, so it comes from Central Asia here uh, about 5,000 years ago with this major shift. And that's also reflected in modern day people in Europe. So depending where you come from in Europe, you have different kind of ancestral components. So if you come from Southern Europe, like from Sardinia, you mostly look like an ancient farmer, an Anatolian uh, farmer that brought agriculture to Europe, whereas if you come, for example, from Estonia, you have a lot of this indigenous Europeans, so the hunter-gatherers, the kind of people that lived in, in Europe uh, between 10,000 and 50,000 years ago or so. Um, and uh, if you come from Norway, you have a stronger component of this uh, kind of steppe people that came about 5,000 years ago. So basically what we could show with this type of research is that there were multiple mass migrations the last one about 4,500 years ago. What we can also do with this type of research is we can actually look at how the phenotype changes through time. Because we are looking at the DNA, and the DNA, of course, encodes your building plan, right? So there's genes that we know, for example, that cause different phenotypic um, traits, like, for example, eye color. So if you, for example, look at the eye color gene that is very high frequency in Central Europe that gives people blue eyes or green eyes, and you look through time, so this is time here, this is the frequency of those genes, and you look, for example, at the one that gives this kind of uh, blue or green eyes. You can see, this is the red here, it's in high frequency in Central Europeans today. So about 70% of the people carry this gene. If you go back in time, you can actually see that in the early farmers, the first people that brought farming to Europe about 6,000 years ago, the frequency is low, so they had darker eyes. Whereas if you go further back in time and you go to the hunter-gatherers, so the people that were living in Europe before, um, the introduction of farming, those all had blue eyes, right? So there was actually a big shift in this, in this phenotype. So 10,000 years ago, they were um, more kind of light-eyed, then they got darker, and then they got lighter again, which was probably caused by those two large migrations into Europe. Whereas if you look at, for example, skin color, um, again, those are kind of traits that are kind of typical for Europeans, where there are two variants that are basically fixed that you find in all Europeans today. So it's those two genes here, so two mutations that cause lighter skin in, in, in people today. Um, and if you go back in time, you can actually see the frequency of them 10,000 years ago was zero. Right? They were actually not present. So if you go back 10,000 years ago, we have to assume that the Europeans, basically the indigenous Europeans, the native Europeans, they actually looked like this. right? They had dark skin and light eyes. So it's actually a very different phenotype to what you find in people today. So then, of course, I could talk now much about Europe, but I already did that yesterday, and today I want to focus on the Ryukyuan Islands. Um, but you might actually notice when you look at this picture, which I already mentioned, that the vast amount of data we currently have for Europe. And actually, if we zoom into Southeast Asia or this region here, we have actually very little data. Right? We have only one ancient uh, genome here um, from the past. We have not a lot of modern data. Um, and uh, in general, there's almost no ancient DNA data for this entire region here. So we know much about the genetic variation of the people that live today in this part of the world, but not so much about the past. And we basically, in the last two years, wanted to change that and focus a bit more on the genetic history of this part of the world. And the first question we tackled before we looked at the Ryukians and the kind of Japanese um, archipelago was a very interesting uh, also question, and that is the so-called Austronesian question. And the Austronesian is a language group like the Indo-European languages, which is actually a large group. There's more than a thousand languages that are spoken in the world today that belong to the Austronesian language family. They're mostly found in Southeast Asia, but they're also found in the Pacific, like in Hawaii, for example, or even Easter Island. But they're also found in Madagascar, so off the coast from Africa. And it had been kind of postulated in the past that this is due to a big migration that happened about 5,000 years ago. This was part of a Neolithic expansion, so people developed agriculture and a lot of seafaring and then expanded in all kinds of places, bringing their languages with them. So if you then do the language approach that I mentioned before that is done in Russell Gray's department in our institute, you can reconstruct, again, a language phylogeny, 
So a tree of the languages of the Austronesian languages. What you then see is those basically different pulses, what they call pulse one here, is where most of those languages diverge from each other. And they dated that to about 5,000 years or four to 5,000 years ago. Those languages dispersed from each other, which would suggest that there was this massive explosion of this group of people about 5,000 years ago. And then there is this kind of second pulse here, which leads to the languages that are spoken in this part of the world, which are the Polynesian languages, which only diverged from each other about two to 3,000 years ago. Again, suggesting that there was this expansion probably happening into Polynesia. And this was a big question still, because this is just based on the languages. What about the genetics? What about the people? And how do they look like? So to then reconstruct the genetic history of this part of the world, and we actually started a project which is headed by Adam Powell, which is one of the group leaders in my department, um, who has this project um, that is called WAVES. And he looked at the genetic history of those people, together with people in my department, to see um, when did this big migration happen, and basically what is the genetic um, history of those people. This is mostly work that was published last year and the year before. Um, and Basically, what we reconstruct, and I want to keep that short because it just should give you a bit of introduction to this part of the world, is that there was this major kind of first pulse of people actually starting in Taiwan about 5,000 years ago, moving pretty quickly um, through what we call near Oceania, which is this region including Papua New Guinea, Bismarck um, Islands, Salomon Islands, um, and, and basically beyond this line here. You have then what's called remote Oceania, which is this other part of the world that actually had not been settled until 3,000 years ago. So here you have people from 50,000 years ago, but beyond this line, nobody really ventured out until 3,000 years ago. So the earliest archaeology you have in remote, uh, remote um, Oceania is only about 3,000 years ago. And the question was always, what type of people then went uh, into this uh, different islands here? Was it part of the Austronesian migration, or was it actually people from Papua New Guinea or Australia that, that went here? Based on the archaeology, it really suggested to, to come this way. But the genetics of those islands actually showed that, especially in this island chain here, which is called Vanuatu, the genetics of the modern people looks like Papua New Guineans. It actually does not look like people from Taiwan or people that speak Austronesian languages. So we then reconstructed um, genetic data from individuals from Vanuatu, so from this um, island chain here, as well as from Tonga, which is here, that are about three and a half thousand years old. And what we found, which was maybe not a big surprise for many people, but for others it was, was that genetically those people were basically Taiwanese. So they were very much Austronesian-like. They were very much like the other people that speak Austronesian. They were not at all Papua New Guinea. However, as I mentioned before, people that live today in Vanuatu are genetically Papua New Guinea. They're not Taiwanese-like. They're not East Asian-like. So something happened after 3,200 years ago, and this is what we then published um, last year. There was indeed a major genetic shift. There was some sort of gene flow happening from the Bismarck archipelago, which is this chain of islands here, to Vanuatu. People probably moving over 3,000 years between Papua New Guinea and this small uh, chain of islands here, and replacing over this time the genetic makeup of those people. So by the end, basically by today, those people here are genetically looking like Papua New Guinean Highlanders, whereas 3,000 years ago, they, they looked like Taiwanese. What is interesting, however, is they still speak an Austronesian language. They don't speak the Papuan language. So it's actually the first place in the world where we find an almost complete genetic replacement, but the language stayed the same, like the first people that came there, which is actually very unusual otherwise. And then, of course, this, the story continues, which is now mostly based on archaeology. So about 2,500 years ago, and we are generating the first data now for Tahiti and for some of those other places like Tawa uh, Hawaii and the Easter Islands or Banui. So about 2,500 years ago, people then moved further um, uh, east. And then about 1,300 years ago, they started to migrate to Kiribati as well as then uh, eventually to Hawaii about 1,000 years ago. Um, then, of course, Tahiti. Uh, New Zealand, as well as then eventually about 800 years ago to Rapa Nui, so to Easter Island, and maybe even to the Americas. So there's some evidence that there was also gene flow between Polynesia and the Americas, but only about 700 years ago, so just before the Europeans actually made contact. So this is really the focus here on the Austronesian, and I told you the story because the Austronesian will become also important when we talk about the Ryukyuan Islands. So then we started a different project, which is actually had by Martin Robets, who is an independent group leader at the Institute, which uh, 
uh, has, a, has a ERC grant as well. And she looks at a language group that is called the Trans-Eurasian Languages. So what are the Trans-Eurasian Languages? They include Japanese, Korean, Tungusic, Mongolian, and Turkic languages. So that's actually pretty wide kind of like category because it's basically the languages that are spoken here and the languages even spoken in Turkey today. They're genetically, or not genetically, linguistically related to each other, at least based on Martin's theory. And she tries to prove this theory. So it's really a theory that she basically established based on the linguistic work that she has been doing over the last 10 years or so. Now she tries to see whether, based on the genetic data and the archaeological data, she can link those different groups with each other. So she has the idea that about seven to 8,000 years ago, there was an expansion of agriculture starting in East Asia, so basically in modern day Jilin province, if you want, um, that uh, is a region where Tungusic languages are still spoken. And then from there, it spread westwards, so with Mongolian and Turkic and the Altaian languages, and eastwards with Korean and Japanese. So at least that's the theory um, that she's trying to prove. So basically, she looks at the prehistory of East Asia using linguistics as well as archaeology and genetics. And out of this project, was basically the project and derived that I want to uh, share with you um, today, and that is the genetic history and the origin of the Ryukyuan Islanders, which is to some extent already known based on archaeology. Of course, there's fantastic archaeology that has been done in this part of the world where people uh, looked at archaeological remains, so stone tools, for example, but also at anthropological remains. In fact, the oldest skeletons that are known on all the Japanese islands, including the Ryukyuan Islands, are actually here from Okinawa. They were discovered some years ago, and they're more than 20,000 years old, which is actually uh, quite, quite amazing. So you can see those skeletons here. And there's also very old archaeology. So people have been here more than 20,000 years ago, maybe even more than 30,000 years ago. So how did the people come here 30,000 years ago? They must have been able to cross the water to come here. Because it's very clear that if you look into the Pleistocene, so this is now basically the Ice Age about 35,000 years ago, you can see that this is the sea level at that time, right? So white is basically the shore. Black is the shore today, and basically gray here, dark gray, is the shore that you, that you find during the Pleistocene. Because the, the water level worldwide was 120 meters deeper than today. And at that time, Taiwan was actually connected to China, which probably made the Chinese very happy. Um, and, sorry, can I say that? Maybe that's not politically correct, but. Uh, yeah, okay, but Japan was also connected to Korea, so <laughs> maybe that's even <laughs> more controversial to say here. But uh, may maybe there's actually a, a little bit of water in between, right? It kind of looks like there was a river, so. But there was no river here, so. Um, so anyway, this was, this was uh, connected, so it was basically like a peninsula, Japan. So people could actually walk here. This is also why Japan was probably also settled very early on. So people were in East Asia, like the oldest human remains, where we have even genetic data from. So modern humans from, from China, or from Beijing, from the Tianyuan side, they're about 42,000 years old. Um, so 42,000 years, modern humans were already present, very clear in, in Beijing and, and, and the region around it. So probably people then also moved in this region here. But then we have about 30 to 35,000 years ago already the presence of people here in Okinawa. So people must have somehow crossed the water to come here, probably with some sort of ships. I mean, people also settled Australia and went to uh, remote islands in Indonesia, so they must have been able to cross uh, water. So this is the early settlement history of the first people. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, we don't have genetic data of those fossils, right? Maybe some of you know the people that curate those wonderful fossils. If they kind of want to work with us, I'm very happy to uh, kind of collaborate with them, obviously. Um, but so far, we didn't really have access to this, even though I think it would be extremely interesting and important to actually see what is the genetic makeup of those people. Because what happens after this time period, about 20,000 years ago, is that suddenly there is a big gap. There's nobody here for 10,000 years. At least people haven't found archaeology of the people. Between 20,000 years ago and about six, seven, 8,000 years ago, there is no archaeological artifacts on these islands. So it looks like people got extinct. Maybe there was kind of climatic conditions were not ideal. The population collapse is not really clear. Um, maybe there was some sort of connection lost to the mainland. But anyway, you don't really find uh, archaeological artifacts here. Only then, in a time period that is called the Neolithic, you then have people again. And that's called the Neolithic because you have then pottery, so you have um, uh, basically pots. But those people, even though it's called Neolithic, which in a lot of places in the world you associate with 
agriculture and farming, those are not agriculturalists. Those are actually hunter-gatherers. They do fishing, they do hunting. They might have some domestic um, uh, crops, but they're mostly really hunter-gatherers. And there's different hypotheses about what those people were and where those people came from, those Neolithic people that lived here about five to six or 7,000 years ago. What the archaeology suggests is that um, the northern part of the Ryukyu Islands was inhabited by people that were closely culturally linked to Japan. And they were linked to the culture of people here um, that is actually well known, which are the Yomon people. So I guess many of you or most of you have heard about those people. Those are basically the native Japanese. Those are the hunter-gatherers that were living in Japan mainland for at least 10,000, probably even more years before agriculture um, arrives in, in Japan. So until about 2,500 years ago, the Yomon people were mostly living in, in kind of the larger parts of, of, um, of Japan. It has been, however, suggested that on the southern Ryukyu Islands, the Neolithic people were different people because the archaeology there is different. The archaeology there doesn't have this Yomon-like, basically, culture. So the archaeology here is different, and people have suggested that the southern Ryukyu Islands are inhabited by Austronesians. So when the Austronesians went all the way into Polynesia, they also came to this group of islands here, and this was basically part of the Austronesian sphere, if you want. And that, at least, was one of the hypotheses. Other people have also said, maybe this is Yomon-like. We're not really um, sure. What seems to be um, kind of commonly accepted, however, is that something changed about two to 1,000 years ago. And that came with the arrival of agriculture, so with a true, if you want, Neolithic expansion, with the agricultural expansion, with on the mainland is connected to this Yayoi rice farmers that come probably from southern Korea um, to Japan starting about 3,000 to about 2,000 years ago with this Yayoi culture starting here about 300 um, BC, so about 2,300 years ago. And they mostly replace the Yeoman-like people on the mainland. They bring rice agriculture, and of course, then the population expands. And this is basically the main ancestry of the people that live in Japan today. It's sort of those people that came to Japan about two to 3,000 years ago. And eventually, those people also made their way onto the Ryukyu Islands. So based on the archaeology, it seems rather clear that there is this big shift of basically archaeology here with farming arriving here about 1,500 to 1,200 years ago, and then basically genetically admixing, but probably mostly replacing the local population of hunter-gatherers. The same what happened also in Japan. And this is also, of course, when then the Japonic languages were introduced, because the Japonic languages are very clearly or highly likely not the kind of native uh, hunter-gatherer languages, but were basically introduced um, from this uh, uh, people, from those rice farmers coming uh, from, from, uh, from the Korean peninsula. And uh, that is also reflected in the different uh, Japonic languages you find on the archipelago today. The Ryukyuan uh, languages are actually part of the Japonic languages. I mean, probably I talked to some of you, um, the main Japanese people can actually not understand Ryukyuan, so it's quite diverged, but it's about a thousand years diverged. So it's like English and German, and I can speak both, but that is just because I learned it, right? Otherwise, you couldn't understand as a kind of native German speaker, you couldn't understand. Um, an English speaker if you don't learn the language. So it's quite distinct languages, but still they have the same basically history being introduced here about 1,000 to 2,000 years ago. So this is mostly now the story based on the archaeology. And we wanted to see, and, and also of course the linguistics as well, we wanted to see what can we say about the genetics. Can we actually get DNA from some of those ancient skeletons that are found on those islands here? So we're looking at the human DNA. And this was work that was mostly led by Mark Hudson. So Mark Hudson is an archaeologist who works in this part of the world. And he actually carried out an archaeological survey as well as an excavation on Miyako. So Miyako is one of the southern Ryukyuan islands here, actually with the central one here, so I think the largest one. And he excavated the site, which is called Nagabaka. And this is here on Miyako, so it's kind of here. So if you zoom in, if you look at Google Maps, so this is this kind of northern part of the island. And here is the archaeological site that he looked at. So there's some, some images here that he provided, um, which is it's actually here, kind of hidden behind those, those rocks. And basically, he met local people. And local people tell them there is this cave full of bones. right? And I'm 
that's interesting for an archaeologist, I guess. So he checked it out. Um, and indeed, when he looked under this rock shelter, it was full of bones. It's all human bones here, right? There's actually piles of human bones. Um, and it was very clear when you looked at the artifacts and you looked at the bones that they are only decades or hundreds of years old, but not super old, right? This is kind of a cemetery that was probably still used in the 19th century. Um, so people basically kind of brought their ancestors to this place. Um, but he still got the permission from the kind of local authorities to carry out a kind of archaeological survey here and dig a trench into part of this uh, rock shelter to see if you go in deeper layers, if you actually also find human remains um, from, from kind of further down in the cave. And they carefully actually put away those human bones after the excavation. They put them back in place and kind of recorded everything because it's basically a burial site that should be protected. And this was the archaeological trench that he dug. It was not super deep, it was just a few meters. So well, this is one meter, so about three, four meters or so. And um, he actually did radiocarbon dating and found out that actually when you went down in the cave, you got quite some old uh, remains. So this is about 3,000 years old here. This is even older than 3,000. And the oldest layers that he had in the site were about 4,200 years old. So it's actually quite some kind of history that he could reconstruct here. And during this excavation, he also found human remains. He found skeletons, about 20 skeletons, um, where he could then provide us samples from, so about 14 that we analyzed. Um, about eight of those 14s um, had analyzable DNA, so they had still had DNA preserved, which we can now study, um, and had low contamination as well, which is important, so they should not be contaminated with the DNA of modern people um, that have touched them or that have lived there, but of course they were just now excavated so very carefully. And even 11 of those 14 had enough what we call mitochondrial DNA. So just as a recap, in a human cell, you not just have DNA in the cell nucleus, which is our nuclear genome, you also have DNA in the mitochondria. And the good thing about mitochondrial DNA is you have many mitochondria in each cell, and each mitochondrium has many mitochondrial genomes, so you have a much higher copy number. So you have 1,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA per nuclear DNA in a cell, so it's easier to analyze. So this is why we have 11 individuals for mitochondrial DNA and only eight for the nuclear genome. So now we have nuclear DNA of those ancient people, and we can do some population genetics. So we can compare how those people from this island looked in the past compared to the people later on and the people in the present. So first, let's look at the people from Asia, at the people from Japan, and at the modern Ryukyuan islanders. How do they compare to each other? So this is a principal component analysis. I don't want to go into the details here, but it basically means that two individuals, if they're close to each other, they're closer genetically related. Right? So those, those uh, Nifkir um, or uh, Tungusic speakers here, they're kind of closer if they're kind of close in, in space. And here you have different groups. So this is uh, Tibetans here, uh, Northeast Asians. This is Siberians here. Um, here you would have Koreans. Um, those are Han Chinese here. Um, those are mainland Japanese, which are, as you see, actually pretty close to Koreans and Han Chinese here. And those are modern day Okinawans. So those are the people, kind of native people. Some might be here in the room, maybe even that participated here. I'm not quite sure. But certainly the genetic makeup, if your grandparents come from here and their grandparents as well, you would probably fall into this cloud here. So you can actually see they are kind of distinct from mainland Japanese. And there's a bit of a kind of, if you want, what we call a client. So basically some sort of kind of genetic uh, kind of clustering here, but kind of falling on a client from Korean through Japanese to those Ryukians. Which in itself is interesting, but it really just tells us about the genetic diversity we see today, and it could even reflect geography, because those are living on those islands, so this is Korea, Japan, the Ryukyuan Islands, so it could just basically be geography, so there's a higher chance, of course, of those people having babies with each other, and those people having babies with each other than having babies with those people. Um, so what now is important, if you want to look through time, to see how they're related to people from the past. And fortunately, um, there's a study which is still not published, but the data became available to us, which is looking at Yomon genomes from Japan. So this is a study which you can find on the bioarchive, so it's already published, but it's not completely published yet. It's just on this uh, preprint server. And uh, those colleagues here, they have actually sequenced the genome of a of a yeoman from about two and a half thousand years ago, so just before agriculture arrives, um, from, from uh, the site which is called Ikawatsu, which is on Honshu. And if you look at the kind of relationship of this yeoman to modern people, 
you can actually see it's quite distinct. So this is a so-called tree mix analysis. So it's basically like a phylogenetic tree, but based on genomic data. Um, so you have different populations. Here the outgroup is an African. Um, here you have Ustishim, which is a 40,000-year-old Siberian. You, you have Europeans, so very old Europeans. Uh, this is an individual that also contributed to Native Americans, so from, from the Baikal region. Here you have East Asians, so you see a Han, you see Ami, Japanese. Um, those are um, uh, individuals from, from uh, Jilin, so from, from the past of some Devil's Gates, about 9,000 years old. Um, and here's the Yomon. You can actually see the Yomon is pretty deeply diverged from the East Asians, right? So it's basically Han and Japanese and, and even Sherpa, so from Tibet, they're much closer related to each other than they are to Yomon. And you have as another outgroup here, Onge from the Adaman Islands, so from kind of close to, between India and, 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 and Thailand. And the Tianyuan here is this 40,000-year-old uh, modern human from, from, from China. So it's actually quite a distinct lineage. What this analysis also allows you is to actually see if there was admixture. So you can see things like here, for example, Malta contributed to um, uh, basically uh, Clovis here, 40%. Clovis is a, a early modern human from, from the Americas, so some of the oldest culture from the Americas. So basically telling us those Malta people contributed a lot of ancestry um, to Clovis. Otherwise, this East is basically a mixture. So Native Americans are a mixture between this guy and those guys. What you also see as an admixture edge here is actually this one here. And that is basically the genetic uh, admixture between Yomon and modern day Japanese. And that is only 3%, right? So modern day people in Japan only have 3% Yomon ancestry. So 97% Korean ancestry, right? That maybe, yeah, for some people it's a surprise, for other people not so much maybe, but it's really a small percent. But it also depends where you are. So those are mostly Japanese, which are part of larger genome consortia, which are from the Tokyo region. If you, for example, go to Ainu, that live on, on Hokkaido, um, they have a very high percent of German ancestry, almost 100%. Uh, even though there's very few of them left that are completely unadmixed, but the few that are left have very high amounts of, of Yomon ancestry, so more than 90%, some of them. So in Hokkaido, you have uh, more of the Yomon ancestry, um, but uh, mainland Japan has very little. They also did um, another analysis where they basically just uh, kind of try to come up with a model of when those different populations diverged from each other. So this is Native Americans diverging from um, kind of East Asians and, and Siberians here about 23,000 years ago. East Asians uh, diverging from East, uh, the Siberians and Native Americans about 26,000 years ago. This is uh, basically this old divergence here of Onge, which is Ottoman Islanders, which is about uh, 30,000 years ago or so. And you can actually see the Yomon they diverged between 26 and about 30,000 years ago from East Asians. So it's a pretty deep diversion that fits very well with this idea that 30,000 years ago or so people came to Japan and then established the Yomon culture. So Yomon is really present in Japan for the last kind of 20,000 years or 30,000 years until about 2,000 years ago when then agriculture arrives uh, from Korea. So now, of course, the question is how do how do this Yomon people relate to Ryukyuans, so the people that live here today, and of course to, to other people in East Asia? So we uh, got access to this data, and if we then put the Yomon on this um, plot, uh, you can actually see the Yomon faults here, so quite distinct from those other East Asian groups, which makes sense because they're deeply diverged from each other. But what becomes also clear is that the client that we see here is actually driven by Yomon. So it seems that Ryukyuans have a higher percent of Yomon ancestry which we can also see in the analysis. So they have about 20% Ryukyuan ancestry, 10%, 20%, depending, of course, if you're more on this side or on that side of the client. Um, but they do have more Yomon ancestry, which in itself is interesting. It really tells us that, yeah, there was probably some sort of admixture with Yomon people here, or the kind of Korean type of people that came here about 1,200 years ago, ago or so had less of an impact on the Ryukyuans than they had on the mainland. But of course, now we want to look at our people from the southern Ryukyuan Islands. We want to see how do they look like. So first, we look at um, three out of four individuals that we had, which we have radiocarbonated to be actually quite recent. With some of the upper bones in the cave were actually um, not as old. They were only about 400 years old or so. And when we look at their genomes and compare them to those uh, kind of modern populations, you can actually see they fall almost exactly on top of the modern Okinawans. So basically, the people 400 years ago, at least on 
uh, Miyako, uh, so on the, on the kind of southern Ryokin Islands, they genetically look almost like the people today in Okinawa. So in the last 400 years, there seems to have not been much of a genetic shift, which is in a way also interesting because there's an interesting history of the region that had been influenced a lot by China as well as by Japan, but that hasn't really left at least a detectable larger genetic impact. So there was quite some genetic continuity between 400 years ago and today on uh, this uh, group of islands. If we now look at the older specimens that are about 2,500 years old and 3,000 years ago, um, they actually look quite different because they fall here. So those are the people from the southern Ryukyuan Islands that are about 3,000 uh, to 2,500 years ago. And they are very clearly quite distinct from the later people, and they're very, very similar to the Yomon people from, from Honshu. So they're basically the same people, right? Um, so they're Yomon, if you want. Yeah, that seems to be uh, very clear. So basically from that, we can um, then say that before agriculture came here, which is 1,200, 1,500 years ago or so, people that lived at least in the southern Ryokin Islands, which then probably is also true for the islands in between, like Okinawa, were basically Yomon-like people. They were not uh, uh, Austronesian people, like people had uh, suggested before. Unfortunately, the oldest specimen that we had here, which was 4,000 years old, didn't have um, enough nuclear DNA, but at least we have the mitochondrial genome of the oldest individual. And this mitochondrial DNA is of a specific type. So this is... Uh, East Asia here again, so this is Indonesia, here is India, this is East Asia. And there's a type of mitochondrial DNA which is called M7A. Many of you might have this uh, if you come from, from, from Japan, Korea, or from the Ryukyuan Islands. It has very high frequency here. So. But it's almost exclusively found in this part of the world. You don't find it on the mainland. So it's really typical. It's probably from the Yomon people because the Yomon genomes also have this type of mitochondrial DNA. So it's basically the original hunter-gatherer, if you want, mitochondrial DNA, which is still present in the people here today. And our old four genomes, so those ones here, they all have this M71A, even M7A1A type of mitochondrial DNA, where the later ones, they have actually types of of uh, mitochondrial DNA you also find on the mainland. So there you also see that shift. But our oldest one um, actually also has this M7A1A. So the old one from 4,000 years ago also has that one. So we can assume that it would also plot here. So 4,000, 3,000, 2,500 years ago, all those people seem to look like Yomon people. So then I already gave that away, but what it basically tells us is that this hypothesis is wrong that this part of the Ryukyuan Islands has not been settled by Austronesian people. At least we don't find evidence for that. Um, instead, what the genetic data seems to suggest is that the Yomon ancestry reached all the way down to the southern Ryukyuan Islands, and that basically all the Ryukyuan Islands between 1,500 years ago and at least four or 5,000 years ago was settled by Yomon-like people. So somehow those people here have managed to travel all the way down here. Why the Austronesians didn't really have a genetic impact on the Ryukyuan Islands. We do not know, of course, but we cannot detect it, at least not with the current um, uh, resolution. What also seems rather clear that sometime after 2,000 years ago, then when agriculture um, arrives in this part um, of the islands, uh, there is this major replacement. So basically the modern gene pool of the Ryukyuan Island gets formed. The same what happens on Japan mainland also happens here on the island, but to a lesser extent. We have on the Ryukyuan Island a larger Yomon genetic component than we have on the mainland. So it's comparable maybe to Hokkaido. So in Hokkaido, as well as in the Ryukyuan Island, you have basically less of this uh, Korean-like or Southern Korean-like ancestry. You have more Yomon-like ancestry, probably because there were small populations coming here, larger populations living here, and there was more admixture happening on those islands than what was happening on the mainland, where probably the farming population was just much bigger. So in conclusions, what can we say? First of all, I hope I could convince you that archaeogenetics is super cool. Then uh, what we can say is that the Ryukyuan Islands were first settled, and this is based on archaeology and, and uh, paleoanthropology um, from, from uh, Japan in the, in the Pleistocene. We don't have, unfortunately, yet genetic data for that. Uh, what we can also say is the early Neolithic people in the Ryukyuan Islands were closely related to the Yoman people, so this is something we can really say based on the genetic data now. That is uh, true also for the southern Ryukyuan Islands. So they were settled during the Neolithic by people closely related to the Yoman people. So they were settled from the north and not from the south. Uh, 
And then modern day Ryukyuns are on a climb between Yomon and Koreans, um, but closer to Yomon people than the mainland people uh, in Japan would be. So the Ryukyuns are closer to Yomon people than mainland Japanese, with the exception of the Ainu. As I mentioned before, they're really the closest to the Yomon people. So after that, basically, it would be people from Hokkaido and people from the Ryukyuns. And of course, which is also important, is that we have the genetic continuity since the 17th century, with this kind of later on uh, specimens that we have analyzed. So basically, nothing major seems to happen between the 16th and 17th century and modern day. So there's no strong impact of some of the more historical events that uh, many of you might be more familiar with than I am, of course. And with that, I would like to thank, of course, uh, our collaboration partners, um, mostly Chung Won, who was the first postdoc, then group leader, and is now a professor in South Korea. So he was first in my uh, department, but now he's in, uh, back in, in, in Seoul, um, where he originally um, graduated from. Um, then Mark Hudson, who's the archaeologist who did the, the work um, on the southern Ryukyuan Islands. Martin Rubetz, who's the head of the ERC project here. And I should also uh, put a, a big uh, thanks to uh, Ryozuke, hopefully I pronounced that right, Kimura, who is uh, a collaboration partner here um, uh, from the uh, Ryukyuan um, uh, Island uh, University, and um, who actually provided the modern genotype data. Without the modern genotype data, it would have not been possible to actually look at the kind of genetic makeup and changes um, in this, in this uh, particular part of the world. So that was extremely important. Of course, the ERC for funding. This is the rest of my uh, group, and uh, thank you for your attention.